I was not very happy earlier this week when I realized the gospel I was supposed to preach on this weekend. I mean, how do you improve on something like this? This is like the gospel of the gospels. I mean, it just sums everything up. I mean, how do you improve on, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first and greatest of the commandments. And the second is like it. You shall love, the, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and prophets are based on these. But then I had a thought. I thought, you know, maybe we, instead of preaching a homily, we'd just all work together and kind of offer up like a prophetic gesture. I mean, they used to preach that way in the Old Testament. I was thinking maybe after the deacon is done proclaiming the gospel, he'd take the gospel and lay it on uh, the altar open, and then I, we would all kneel, and I'd prostrate myself right up here, just like when I was ordained, and we'd just stay in that position for 10 minutes. And that would be the homily prophetic gesture. But I figured you guys wouldn't like that. You wouldn't let me get away with that. So um, I thought, let's take this angle. Let's see if we can at least touch a little bit upon the meaning of this and made this gospel of gospels, the heart and soul of our, the um, belief that we have as Catholics. And I was thinking we'd take this angle. When, when you try to tell someone that they, sh they should keep holy the Lord's Day, which really is one of the three commandments that fleshes out the command, you shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. When we, we try to tell someone that they should keep holy the Lord's day, what, what reason do we give? Or putting it in different words, when we try to explain to someone why they should go to church on Sunday, what reason do you and I give? I guess we could say, well, I go to church on Sunday to save my soul. If I don't have a legitimate excuse, it's a serious, indeed, it can be a mortal sin to miss church on Sunday. I want to go to heaven. That's why I worship the Lord on Sunday. And, and that's true as far as that goes. And we could say, we could take a different approach with somebody. We could say, I go because I experience a deep sense of peace when I go and worship my Lord on Sunday. And that too would be true. I, I remember years ago at St. Peter and Paul when I started out as a priest, a young lady raised by two parents that were atheists walked in the church and after a while she came up to me and she wanted to become Catholic because when she came to church she felt a sense of peace so there's truth in that we could probably take a different angle we could say I go just because it helps kind of center me for the week It kind of sets the pace for the week it centers me it gives me balance one of my sisters likes to say that and I think that's true but in another sense, all three of these responses are wrong. We do not go to church on Sunday to save our soul, to feel peace, to get spiritual refreshment, to be centered, to be balanced, to bond with our brothers and sisters. No, if, if these are the reasons, the only reasons we worship God, then we're really missing out. We don't get it. We worship God because He is God. To him be all glory and honor and praise forever and ever. We don't come here to pray to be healed, to find joy, so that God will give us a job to be centered. We gather here for nothing other than to give glory and honor to he who was, he who is, and he who shall be forever and ever. Amen. We come here not to make God part of our lives, but to become part of his life. We come here not to welcome him into our world, but to be welcomed into his. I remember years ago, one theologian going so far as to criticize Pope John Paul, now Saint John Paul, for making his theology too anthrocentric and not theocentric enough, too much focused on us and not enough on God. It's something to think about. There might be some validity in that in regards to our modern theology. You see, it isn't about us. It's about God. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Now, obviously, we can pray for all these other things too. But as Jesus said in another place, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, 
and all these other things shall be given unto you. Do you see it? Think about it. And then there's the second commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And, and that one is fleshed out in commandments 4 through 10. How do we explain this one? Again, it's too big for one priest or one little sermon to really get at the whole picture, but I have to say when I was thinking about this, that we are to love our neighbor as ourself, it brought to mind a student I had. I hope I didn't tell you this story already. I don't have that many stories to tell, but it brought to mind this uh, student I had. He was a master at getting under my skin. Oh, he, he just had a way about him. He was the class clown and just liked to do that. Well, one day, he was acting like the lawyer of today's gospel, you know, trying to trip up Jesus. In the today's gospel, he was trying to trip me up, and he was getting under my skin. And he must have, he must have perceived it, that he was getting to me. So in so many words, he finally said to me, Father, you know what? I don't think you love me. Do you? I can tell. And you're supposed to love everyone. I don't know, Father Joe. He was getting to me, but for some reason, this thought came to my mind, and I looked at him with a straight face, and I said, John, I love you. I just don't like you. <laughs> I'll never forget that. The story ends well, because a few years later, something happened in his life, and it brought us together, and uh, we parted with real respect for one another, and I give God thanks for that. But that doesn't always happen, does it, with people that we don't like, people that maybe even are our enemies who have hurt us or continue to hurt us very profoundly. But, you know, this is an important distinction. We aren't going to like everybody, but we must love them. That's an act of the will. We can't always control how we feel towards people, but we can always will their good. We can always force ourselves to pray, even though it's very difficult. You know, this is the way God was and is toward us. I mean, as St. Paul said in one place, while we were still sinners, while we were still spitting at him, while we were still wounding his honor and glory, he died for us. How are we going to be children of God if we too can't love one another that way, even while they hurt us, to, to love them? I know there's people that we really struggle to be around. Pray for them. Force yourself to pray for them. Even if it feels revulsive, if it's that difficult, but pray for them <clears throat> and mean it with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. And don't do it to heap coals on their head, okay? That's not it. But pray that God will bless them. And I guarantee you something will change in your heart. You will feel something. I really think God will come into our hearts in a powerful way if we can just find the strength to do that. And then, as Jesus says in another place, then we shall be true children of God, a God who makes his sun rise on the good and the bad and causes rain to fall on the just and the unjust. In short, I guess what I appreciate about these two great commandments is that it gets the focus it forces me to take my focus off my little world and my life, which is all passing away. We were created not for our own sake. We were created for God's honor and glory and for the salvation of others. The truth is, we find our place only in serving the glory and honor of God in one another. That's, I think, the secret to happiness. May God help you and I find the courage to embrace and follow that path.